Hello and welcome to Hot Issues. And uh, first of all, let me apologize for my fading voice. I've done everything possible to bring it up, but it's not just working. And I guess life must continue. This week, we are going to take a look at what has become popularly known as judgment death. What are the conditions which have given rise to judgment death? In any case, what are judgment deaths at all and so on? And we have with us in the studio a very distinguished personality to discuss the issue of judgment death. Welcome to Hot Issues. Hello and welcome back to Hot Issues. As I indicated this week, we are taking a look at judgment deaths. What are judgment deaths? What are the conditions in which judgment deaths have occurred? And how can we safeguard the national purse against judgment debt and many other questions. And we are particularly fortunate to have with us in the studio Mr. Kofi Abochi. He is the dean of the Jimpa, uh, uh, Jimpa Law School. So you're welcome to the studio. Thank you, Chrissy. Yes, sir. Generally, what are judgment debts? Well, judgment debts are debts that are acquired upon the award of judgment against the party. So when judgment is passed and when reliefs are granted in respect of claims the party makes before a court, two circumstances arise. One party becomes a judgment creditor. The judgment creditor is the one who obtains a favorable judgment which he can execute. And the judgment debtor is the one against whom the judgment has been awarded in respect of which um, to avoid, you know, unfortunately I can't find proper, uh, similar words, but in legal parlance, we'll say, in respect of which execution will be levied. So you levy execution against a party who has suffered certain consequences by that judgment. That party is a judgment debtor, and the judgment that has been given, what has arisen out of the judgment, is the judgment debt. Why has this become such a huge issue in Ghana today? It has always been the case. The reason it has become a huge issue has particularly to do with the fact that in recent times, We've suffered such huge judgment debts that have had a consequence on the budget. I'm not quite sure whether it was in 2007 or 8, but in the not too distant uh, past, there was an incident in which the finance minister reading the, judge, uh, the budget in parliament actually had to speak on the question of how the judgment debts that have been suffered within the period have impacted on the balance sheet the nation's balance sheet. Mm. And that, for the first time, in my opinion, demonstrated the impact of judgment debts as far as our national purse is concerned. So it has always been there. This is not the first time. But I think in terms of the quantum and in terms of the overall impact on our national balance of um, you know, payment issues, our national balance sheet overall, um, the judgment debt issue has become a major um, a major factor and that is why I think that it has become an issue of discussion today. It's always been there. It's not the first time. It's not only an, a recent phenomenon. Mm. But what are the factors you know, which lead to judgment debts? The key factor which may lead a party suffering ju judgment debt, and in this context, the government suffering judgment debt is one, improper administration of contracts. Two, improper um, um, improper understanding of its own legal obligations as a result of which it incurs legal liabilities and then finally um, improper defense strategies and so when you are sued when a government is sued what are the defensive uh, efforts that are put in defending government's interests as far as this is concerned and I think that the third one has been a major issue in recent times but of course as big as that is the key issue is the initial issue of incurring legal liabilities. So when you have agents of states who are operating on behalf of government, what decisions do they take? How are these decisions taken? What are the consultative processes that are involved in taking these decisions? And in respect to the third factor, to what extent is the Attorney General's Office, for instance, consulted? Our system is established in a way that creates certain anomalies. You have certain ministries signing documents embarking and assuming legal obligations when the Attorney General's Department have not had the opportunity to either previously advise and therefore clear 
as far as these transactions are concerned. They may sign these documents, they may go about administering these documents without reference to the Attorney General's Department, and in some circumstances, they incur breaches. The only time the Attorney General may actually get to know of some of these things is when the breach has happened, there has been a suit issued, uh, a rate issued, or a suit instituted, and then the Attorney General is served because by the legal structure, the Attorney General is the appropriate entity to receive legal processes to be, to be sued on behalf of government. And so whenever the suit happens, it is brought against the Attorney General, but all the initial processes leading up to the ultimate suit, the Attorney General may be in the dark. And so there is a structural flaw, an anomaly, that has arisen as a result of practice. Many of these things have not arisen as a result of a proper set, uh, as a result of a setup situation. No, the setup situation is right. I.e., government subsectors are supposed to coordinate with the Attorney General as far as legal processes are concerned. But by practice, many of them end up doing their own things, and the Attorney General only gets to know for the first time that there is a problem when it is served with a suit or with um, the the notice of intention to sue. And again, even the law has actually given the opportunity for the Attorney General to be notified within a period of 30 days before the suit is instituted. Mm -hmm. That particular legal process can actually be insisted upon to, to kill a case. But again, if your lawyers do not raise these objections, the case may go on. And if you do not have a judge who probably is also proactive on some of these, some of these things, the case may go on. So it's a complex of factors that, has, um, or that have sorry, come together to, as it were, creates this rather dangerous trend of judgment debts that we continue to incur by day. What about the factor of uh, criminal collusion? It certainly could be there, and you cannot rule that out. It is potentially possible that I can collude with a party to provide a very weak defense in order to allow the party to easily win the case with the prospect that I may share in the booty. That is a potential human possibility. You can't discount that. Mm -hmm. However, if that is happening, there are systems, processes, and laws to take care of that. And are we exploiting these? Maybe that is a case, that is a point where the answer could be in the negative. Mm -hmm. For instance, a lawyer will be disbarred immediately if a case of criminal collusion is established and a complaint is lodged before the uh, General Legal Council. But I'm not sure we've had many of these complaints in terms of collusion, particularly coming from the government side. And so as far as that is concerned, at this stage we can only speculate. Um, in terms of the findings of the Judgment Debt Commission, um, well, to the best of my knowledge, I, I know there has been a case involving a particular lawyer who has been investigated. But as to whether we have a clear case of a conviction, for which cause we can say that criminal collusion has been established within the gov governmental legal processes, we can only speculate at best. But clearly, there appears to be pointers in that direction that makes it very difficult for anyone to say that that is impossible or that that is not happening. Is there no remedy for the state when it's established, for example, that uh, the Attorney General's Department offered a very, very weak defense, I and mean, a defense that is so weak that it can only be deliberate? The remedy is against the state official. There are laws there. The laws are clear that if a state official causes financial loss to the state by his actions or inactions, that state official is liable to punishment, mm -hmm. criminal punishment. Mm -hmm. And remember that the law does not deal with intent, nor does it deal with benefit. So we don't even have to establish the fact that you actually benefited out of that. All we have to establish the fact that you have a mandate, a public mandate, and by your actions or omissions, you have incurred losses for the state. In that respect, you are liable. Um, that, that, that is the remedy that a state can employ. But there is no remedy in court because in court, your lawyers are your agents. Mm -hmm. And you choose the good or bad lawyers and you bear the responsibility for them. Mm -hmm. So if your lawyers choose not to come to court, if your lawyers choose to come to court but not to, as it were, push things as best as they could, uh, whatever your lawyers do, it is your liability. It's not the state will not bear that liability. Mm -hmm. And in court, government is just a party. Mm -hmm. Government is not given any special priorities. Um, government is treated just like any entity. If for anything at all, probably government may actually have things dealt against it because of the perception that government has all the arsenal. I mean, sorry, government has all the arsenal and the weaponry to fight its cases. And so, if government doesn't put together 
it acts, you know, you wouldn't have that, that sympathy. The only challenge, of course, here is that whatever losses that the state incurs, it is our losses. Whatever losses the state suffers, these are our, our taxes. And these are things that we will have to ultimately pay f from our collective resources. I think that's the problem with judgment debt. Because traditionally, people have not been held personally responsible for judgment debts. Um, and be there, there's an understanding that the realm will bear the cost. There's been little incentive, probably, over the years for people to take responsibility. Maybe that is the part that, 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 um, that could be looked at. But there is no real remedy in court that the state can come back and plead for its case to be heard again because it was not able to put its acts together. That, that, that is not a plea the court would accept. What about cases where criminal collusion cannot be established or may not be established and yet on the face of, of, of the arguments in court and the conduct of the defense, you can say that the defense was weak. What factors may account for that weakness? Defenses are weak or strong on the basis of the preparation and competence of attorney. To put together your defense, you must have a clear understanding of the scope of your case. You must have a clear understanding of the character of the evidence. You must have an understanding of the parties you're going to be dealing with, and particularly your witnesses who are going to speak on your, on your side. You must have an understanding of a myriad of factors, and you must put in the, in the requisite industry to be able to put all that together. That is a difficult task. I have said that sometimes we have a mismatch of incentives and, and, um, and, and motivation. The private, for, and I'm, I'm going to give the example of, of criminal cases in particular. You know, in the case of criminal cases, which normally don't incur judgment debt, you know, but which, which create certain peculiarities, the state has a very high obligation, and that obligation is to secure conviction beyond reasonable doubt, that the accused person has committed the offense beyond reasonable doubt. Putting the evidence together is a Herculean task. Now, the private person who is being defended by a private lawyer he motivates his lawyer by paying commercially. Um, the lawyer has an understanding that his own professional standing is in line on the basis of whether he wins or loses the case and how he conducts the case. Now, the state's attorney may probably complain of improper incentives, that he's probably not well paid, his colleague in private practice is doing better, among others. Some of these mismatches may actually sometimes feed into the quality of representation that is provided on either side of the divide, whether it's the, 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 the accused person or it is the state defending its side. We have similar scenarios and dynamics when it comes to the um, civil cases. Because in the civil cases, again, you may have a case on which um, a private attorney may be paid a certain amount of money, a percentage, 10%, you know, 15%, whatever, 5% of a huge amount. And therefore, he understands that on the basis of the industry that he puts into the case, if ultimately victory is won, he stands to benefit 10% of a huge amount of uh, a huge sum of money. Mm -hmm. He is going to put in the necessary um, industry to ensure that ultimately he gets the outcome that he expects. Now that is a lot of work, but that is matched by the requisite incentives. Mm -hmm. On the other side, you may have a state attorney who is tied to uh, salary, and whether lose or win, salary is standard and is the same, and he's probably not too happy with the salary. And the amount of work he needs to put in to be able to deflect that uh, prosecution, which has been mounted against, um, against, against, against the government, is huge. The incentive and the motivation may not be as much as that of the private uh, citizen. Of course, somebody would argue that this is not only for lawyers. It's, it's general. You know, the, the public servants is probably facing the same thing as other people in private commercial uh, you know, transactions are facing, but they have to deal with them all the time. And so I can understand that there are similar, the similarities involved here. But here you are dealing with a case in which there is a competitive dynamic. If government doesn't put its acts together as per its defense, the other side will win because in court there is competition. There is hardly a case of equality. The court must give a judgment. That says a party has won or lost. And that depends on what you put in. And that also, as I said, invariably is affected by. The, the, the level of industry and the motivation, among others, that is uh, characterizing, or that characterizes the, um, the, 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 the case, as it were. Beyond the skills of lawyers, to what extent do the true facts influence these judgments? The skills of the lawyers and so on is one thing. 
the true facts are another. Well, that is true. The court, and I know when I say this, especially to the public, some people may be astonished um, to hear this, but there's a reality. The courts do not set out to investigate the truth, so to speak. The courts set out to investigate the truth according to the evidence. The courts are cause of law. They are called cause of justice, but the justice is justice according to law, and the law is built on evidence. So you need to establish your case on the basis of the evidence. We deal with a system. Our legal system is called the acquisitorial system. The continental Europe and the civil law countries of Africa, such as Cote d'Ivoire and the French countries in particular, they operate what is called the inquisitorial system. There are two different systems. The inquisitorial system deals with the court taking center stage in the proceedings. So the judges actually investigate their facts. So the prosecution will give it facts, the defense will give it facts, the plaintiff or the defense will give it their facts. The court will now embark on an inve independent investigation to reconcile the facts and to make a decision. And therefore, the court may come out with facts that are totally different from both sides and may give a verdict that is not reflective of the evidence before it. Those courts can be said to be interested in the truth. They actually go out there seeking the truth. The common law, which is the acquisitorial system, deals with a situation where the judges take a back seat. The judges are independent arbiters. They are neutral, they are disinterested, they look on. They look on while a party makes its case, and they look on while a party destroys its case. Now, the judge's interest is to look at the evidence that is presented before it. The essence of that is to avoid a situation where the judge is, ac is accused of being partisan. The danger of a judge going out there to further investigate beyond the evidence that is presented is that a party can easily level accusations of partisanship on the judge, that the judge has taken sides. And so the judge is actually going out there and is looking for extra things to nail the other side. So this is the advantage of the acquisitorial system. It gets the judge to just sit back and say, look, the two of you, I wasn't there when the incident happened. We are not parties to your transaction. I'm going to listen to you. You have all the time in the world. I'm going to listen to you as much as I need to listen to you. And you need to convince this court by the evidence that your case on the balance of probabilities is stronger than the other party's case. It's up to you to make or make your case. And so that is where the factor of your lawyer becomes material because a strong lawyer then will be able to present the kind of evidence that, the kind of evidence that convinces a court, i.e. the judge or the jury, that your case should be bought on the balance of probabilities more than the other side. Again, if you have a weak lawyer, what it means, or if you, have a, if you have a nonchalant lawyer, you know, basically he just doesn't present what he has to present, and unfortunately you look on as you destroy a case. So yes, good cases are lost all the time, and bad cases are won sometimes. And so yes, the fact that the public sometimes believe that lawyers can do magic, occasionally law, lawyers do, do, ma lawyers do <laughs> perform what you call uh, magic, but usually when lawyers perform magic, it's an indication of the weakness of the other side, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, the judges themselves not enjoined to carefully weigh the consequences of their judgment on society? That's a debatable issue. It's, it is called the consequentialist theory. Judges have been invited to consider the consequences of their actions on society. Some judges are consequentialist, and some judges will do the balancing and to check whether or not my judgment is likely to throw society into chaos or it's going to be functionally helpful. Some judges say that is not the business of a judge. Indeed, some judges will say that if you are a consequentialist, you are not a just judge. Because what it means is that you weigh and you balance. So one person's interest, if I grant him his interest, the whole society loses. So we sacrifice him and we grant the judgment to society. That is unfair. That is unjust. One person's interest must equally be protected, even if it's against everyone else. It's a very deba it's a debatable jurisprudential issue, and I have to be honest, at this stage, it's not as if it's been settled. But practically speaking, and being pragmatic, judges are sometimes consequentialist, and particularly at the constitutional level, at the Supreme Court constitutional level, where decisions can lead to instability and chaos. Sometimes and very often, judges are consequentialist. Mm. But I have to be honest, as I indicated, some judges are simply some judges simply say this is not their business. Your business is look at the law, evaluate the evidence, make a judgment. It may be against the whole world, one person, that's good enough. Others will say, do a consideration of everybody else and be sure that ultimately your, judge, your judgment doesn't destroy the fabric of society in which we all live. 
as I said, it's a debatable one, and some judges are, others are not. Welcome again to Hot Issues, and I must apologize again for my terrible voice. I've tried to do many things about it, but it's still not going, and uh, please bear with us. You spoke earlier about the bad legal advice that some ministries, departments, and agencies get. How could we correct that? It's a human issue. It's an institutional cultural issue, uh, multifaceted. As I indicated, the structure itself is not fundamentally problematic. The ministries and the other sectors have been established in a way as to work in a coordinated fashion, particularly as regards the Attorney General's Department. The Attorney General's Department is the chief entity to advise government understood in the broader sense, not just the executive, but government's business understood in the broader sense. Therefore, while nearly all the ministries have legal departments, they all have lawyers attached, or nearly all of them have lawyers attached to them, the understanding is that for official communication and for official advice, the Attorney General's Department must advise ultimately for major transactions to be cleared. But as, as I indicated earlier, by practice, it turns out many agreements are signed, many documents are executed without reference to the Attorney General's Department. Very often, the Attorney General's Department has not even heard or seen that there's any such transaction ongoing. Everything is completed, done, executed, and consummated until there's a suit. And very often, the Attorney General's Department would, for the first time, hear of such a thing when there's a suit. My concern, though, is that the Attorney General's Department, again by law, has been given a certain, of government, has been given a certain, um, a certain moratorium on suit by the notification process. Mm -hmm. So while I can just sue you without any notice, you can't sue government until you have notified government. But by practice, there have been instances where people have sued government without notifying government, and the judicial process has also not been very strong in stopping that. And of course, again, that depends on whether you will have the requisite legal representation to stop that process. But government has been given a certain um, opportunity to be notified of a pending suit. The essence of that is to allow government to rearrange itself to avert the potential suit. So government reviews whatever the complaint is and comes to the conclusion that there is... Uh, uh, there, is, th there is a certain justification in having this matter resolved. And so if there's a payment, payment is made. If there's some rearrangement, whatever has to be done is done to ensure that the suit doesn't mature. But very often, these things are written to Attorney General's Department, to the Attorney General's Department, and very often people do not get feedback. And so they end up having the matter actually maturing to the point of suits, um, rates being issued among others. So the point I'm making is for us to be able to actually cure this, you need to have changes in human behavior. That the agents and the officials who are running these institutions, you know, at different levels, must have changes in behavior. But more importantly, I think that we may probably want to look again at, you know, some degree of institutional reform, particularly in the area of the coordinating components, in terms of the execution of legal documents, among others, how various institutions are coordinated and how various institutions talk to each other, either on a daily basis or periodically. There must be some um, opportunity of interaction, and I do not think that at this stage it is happening the way it is happening if the numbers of judgment debt is a reflection of anything at all. It's a reflection of dysfunction. Could the problem not be cured simply by making sure that the AG's department is represented in all ministries, agencies, and departments. That would, in my opinion, be a duplication of a kind, which may not necessarily be functional, in my opinion. And the reason I say this is the legal departments of the various ministries more or less should reflect the ages. They are, in truth, they are not representatives of the ages. But the structural intent is to keep in there professionals who are lawyers, who understand the legal process, and who will give initial advice or, or who will ensure that legal processes are completed. And they, with their training and understanding, will then liaise with the Attorney General's Department with, of course, requisite uh, instruction to complete the process. Mm -hmm. So with legal departments in these ministries and having AG attaches also in these ministries will appear to be 
a bit of a duplication in terms of what really can be done at this stage, which simply ought to be done. And I think that if we do not change the um, human components, you may actually have AG's representatives there, and the same scenario, the same things may happen. Unless, of course, you will say that given the fact that these people report to the Attorney General, they may have different incentives in terms of whom to uh, send their work to on a daily basis. But I think, really, the problem just has to do with institutions functioning the way they are supposed to function. And as I indicated, part of the problem has been because in the past, there has really been no responsibility in terms of what happens when we incur these liabilities and whose fault is it in terms of us having diagnostic um, uh, investigations into how a particular ministry incurs so much. If, for example, some ministries have their budgets cut or slashed on grounds of the fact that their omissions and their indiscretions have led to certain judgment that, that we suffered in the previous year, and therefore for this year you are suffering this quantum um, of loss, if there is some responsibility, I think ministries will become a bit more active in terms of how their decisions ultimately affect the government purse. Hmm. Well, now, there, there's, there's a peculiar problem. First of all, have you read the so-called leaked judgment debt commission report? I have not made myself an expert of it yet. I am aware of gen the outcomes generally. I have read bits and snippets of it, yes. Are you aware, for example, that we have spent up to 44 billion cities employing foreign lawyers? I am aware of the fact that we have spent quite an amount. I can't remember that figure. But yes, I'm aware that the commission was clear on how much money we've spent representing foreign counsel. Yes, I'm aware of that. Now, couldn't we just have used that kind of money to, to up our game, to, 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 to give incentives to our lawyers and to employ a lot more lawyers? 44 billion cities is a lot of money. It certainly is. Um, I'm not, I can't remember again the time frame, but I'm aware that we have, as a country, been engaging foreign counsel for some time certainly no less than 10 years. We've been engaging set, uh, foreign counsel. In some circumstances, we've actually been retaining foreign counsel um, advising government in Ghana. The reality is that when you suffer an international suit or when government is a party to international transactions, in some circumstances, some of these things are quite complex. And admittedly, the training capacities and competencies of Ghanaian lawyers in some circumstances may not be quite up to ultimately. Again, I have to be careful how I say this. I'm not saying per chance that lawyers in Ghana are not competent, but given the diversity of the training out there, in some circumstances and particular transactions, certain specialized fields of legal practice is required. And it has happened in some instances that um, it becomes justifiable and it becomes necessary to go out there and look for law firms that have expertise and niche in very specific areas. And I have to, be, I have to give the example. I mean, the example of uh, the um, oil find and transboundary litigation. These are very complex, very specialized fields. They are very narrow, very specialized fields. And out there, there are law firms that specialize only in particular fields. You know, we have a lot of general practices in this country because of the smallness of the market. And so invariably, you have almost every lawyer doing almost everything, apart from the few corporate lawyers and law firms that are coming up lately. But out there, you may have specialized subject lawyers who have been doing these over the years, and many of them have acquired uh, track records over the years. I can tell you, Ghana is not alone in this. Um, even the rich countries and the well-established countries of the, of the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, they have all been known to have engaged and retained American, and British, and other European lawyers for major transboundary litigation and other international litigations with other uh, countries. I think the advantage in this is that you can actually go out there and look for pedigree so that you get a law firm that, or a law, a law, a law, a law chamber that has all the expertise in dealing with a particularly specialized field. Having said that, how we go about this may explain why we spend probably so much. Because apart from this, there may be some general litigation issues. There may be you know, instances in which Ghanaian lawyers could have actually been identified, motivated, and would have, could have been given the same amount to have, um, or even less, to have litigated this on behalf of Ghana. The Attorney General's Department could have been resourced and the lawyers in there could have been better incentivized to have, you know, and therefore you attract the very best 
you know, because you're paying. So people are happy to come and stay. They don't come and leave, among others. So all these reasons you've advanced, they are genuinely, they are certainly true. But it's important for us to have a global understanding of this, that the fact that you have gone out there for a law firm of itself is not a bad decision. The question is, the context must be evaluated. There are some of the circumstances when Ghanaian lawyers could have been employed, and they were not employed in these circumstances. And I think that, um, you know, it may just be a reflection of the Ghanaian taste for foreign things. I'm sure as for that, I don't have to go into that. It may be a general reflection of that problem. But having said that, um, there are instances where there's justification to identify a firm with pedigree because you do a balancing of the issues involved and you come to a conclusion that if I stand to lose, four, let me use the word 40 billion, if I stand to lose 40 billion dollars and I could, I could hire a law firm out there and I could just pay them 500,000 dollars, if I do the balancing, ultimately if they get, if they get me the 500,000 dollars on a quid pro quo basis, I am happy to go for that knowing that I'm guaranteed the 40 billion dollars than to gamble when I'm not quite sure of the other option. So these considerations will have to be made. And the question is, who's making them? And the question is, what are the rational factors that are considered before a decision is made that we're going out there or we are choosing from within? I would, I would think that uh, 44 billion cities is enough to equip Ghanaian lawyers with any skills that they may require <laughs> absolutely. in, in any no, battle of that nature. Uh, absolutely. Um, you've, you've hit the nail on the head on this particular issue. You can actually, there are various models of doing this. One option is to identify the key subject areas of litigation that as a country we confront. For from example, now we know that we are in oil and correct, gas, correct. And, and therefore we need correct, to pay some attention. Correct. So boundary issues, maritime mm -hmm. issues, uh, naval issues, you know, international diplomatic issues. You can identify the key subject areas mm -hmm. and probably decide that I'm going to train 100 good lawyers in this field. These lawyers may be in the Attorney General's Department. We're sending them out there for training. We are attaching them out there to law firms which have specialization in this mm -hmm. for training. Mm -hmm. They can go out there two, three years, be trained, and come back and build solid departments in the Attorney General's Department. You know, the, attorney, the fact that the Attorney General's Department at this stage still doesn't have huge departments on, say, international law, on oil law, on maritime law, and they are still pretty much operating in the general way that they've been operating in the last... Um, 10, 15 years with minor changes. All these could be indications of what you're saying, that we could have invested the money in that department, spent the money on the lawyers in there by way of incentive and capacity building and would have retained them. Because as I indicated, law practice is a commercial proposition. And if and when I see my classmates around in private practice doing okay, and I'm stuck in the Attorney General's department and my salary is not great, the motivations are or invariably dampened. And by reason of that, it will affect the passion and the energy that is invested in the litigation and the cases that they have to actually deal with on behalf of government. And so recently we had on strike, remember? It tells you that you have this pent-up thing in them and they may not be expressing it every day. I think we have to face um, the bull by the horn. And that means that we simply have to put our money where our mouth is. Investment in the department and building the capacity of the department is a long-term, medium to long-term thing to do, and it's something that is certainly uh, worthy of support. When can lawyers be said to be doing well? When they're making a lot of money or when they're winning <laughs> cases in court? Okay, this question will have to be answered by reference to what happens in society in general. Mm -hmm. You know, a few years ago, I'm sure you have more life experience than I do. I'm sure, a few years ago, the question of who is a successful person in life the context has changed, the definitions have changed. A few years ago, people invested in excellence. And so you did what you have to do with a passion, knowing that by the product being well, that is the judgment on you in terms of how good or bad you do your work. Today, I think the dynamics are different, the variables are different. People's consideration of money has become the ultimate. The public perception of yourself is another issue. Who do the public say is a good lawyer? <laughs> Invariably, the public's consideration of who a good lawyer is, in many ways, have to do with, of course, your money. Because for them, your money is a reflection of um, your performance. So what, how much you gain is an indication of how much you're putting in, which may not be true. Again, um, whether you're winning cases or you're losing cases, it is a traditional consideration of who a good or, who a good or a bad lawyer is. So yes, all these are factors. But if I should zero in on our current societal perceptions 
and the indicators of who a, a successful person or a failure is, then invariably I think money plays a pivotal one in, to, in today's consideration of who a good lawyer is, which is a general thing, not just a good lawyer, a good professional. The perception is the more money you have. You know, but as I said, it's it's a very flawed conception. In spite of all the concerns about judgment debt, in spite of the fact that uh, Justice Apau has completed his work and submitted a report and so on, there are still indications that uh, some people are likely to go to court. Are you aware of, of this trend? I am aware. I mean, I'm aware of contracts that have been cancelled. I'm aware of looming contracts, the looming potential judgment debts. We've seen reports on various media outlets. Um, for instance, the recent uh, digital migration mm -hmm. project, which uh, we have just been informed recently that there has been a cancellation of the contract. And I have seen somewhere that they're suing government for $200 million. That is frightening. If they're going to sue government for $200 million for a project which is in the region of $100 million or so, and they're going to add all the expectations which have been lost and even the potential embarrassment by way of international standing and pedigree for the uh, particular uh, corporation involved, all these are losses that we can avert. Again, in the light of the facts of these cases, one, w one would ask, what is the coordination between the Attorney General's Department and the Ministry of Communication? Has the Attorney General's Department advised on the cancellation of this project? And if the Attorney General's Department has not advised on the cancellation of this project, what is the validity of the cancellation of this project? But mind you, when we are out there, especially as they are about to sue in London, I'm informed, um, you know, if we are out there, there is no consideration or worry or concern by an international tribunal on whether there's a coordination between ministries or whether there's a failure of institutions or there's a dysfunction. They are not worried about this. The basic consideration is whatever action is taken by a government agency, whatever action is taken by a government institution or an agent, that is a corporate government. It binds everyone. We are all bound. And so the idea of ministries not talking or agencies not talking or they not having a smooth relationship is of no moment anywhere, and that is why as a country we should be concerned about some of these things when they do happen with the potential prospect that we stand to lose. As I indicated, $200 million for a country that has gone through some distress and through government's initiative we've had some respite from the IMF, among others. You know, $200 million lost merely by reason of improper termination is certainly an issue that is worth being looked at and being... Uh, being carefully dealt with. And that's why I'm glad that I think we are still at the pre-court stage. So it appears that that particular case, I think it's developing. And everything I have read, it looks as if there's consideration of they're going to court. It's an intent. It doesn't appear as if they are there yet. If that is the case, then this is the moment for us to arrest that process. What is the engagement? Is government engaging these people? I mean, again, that's where the human factor comes in, ultimately. Well, you are, you are a lawyer and, and more. You actually teach law. Have you followed what you have followed with regards to the case on the digital migration? Is there a justification for the cancellation of the contract? Could there be a justification? The only justification there could possibly be is if there's been a breach of contract by the other side. And if there's a breach of contract by the other side, you have to establish that by the consequences of the breach of contract, which obviously would be included in the contract, the other party, it is justified for the party terminating to terminate. Very good contracts contain circumstances of termination. Mm -hmm. They will indicate the circumstances, they will itemize them, and they will go further to indicate circumstances when a party could invoke the termination, which normally should be preceded, again, in good contracts, by some attempts at remedies. So you have to notify the party of default that you are in breach and then seek remedies. Such a project invariably is a big project. And from my understanding of this project, it appears this project is actually a project between governments. Mm -hmm. And so invariably, the dynamics are going to be complex. You are not likely to have a situation in which a simple act of um, omission, for instance, could justify a termination invariably. Normally there is some consultative 
um, collaborative engagements that are instilled in the contract, just designed to ensure that the parties actually have an opportunity to deal with the con to deal with whatever breaches have been alleged by a party complaining. And so, I find it hard to believe that the possibility exists that in this contract, a simple act could lead to termination without a notification to that effect. And if there has been, if there has been a, uh, a breach and there has been a prior notification to that effect, the question is what actions and steps have been taken by the party against whom the allegations were made to correct and remedy them, and whether there were any such actions or an opportunity given in the first place. So in the light of, again, all that I've read, yeah, the, the news has monitored out there, it does appear as if whatever termination may, may be in the offing, if, well, actually, it seems the termination has already happened. Whatever termination has um, been, been done may appear to be a bit hasty. And particularly for me, the worry may lie in the fact that we've had very difficult circumstances, very difficult issues with judgment debts. And that's why any termination that government wants to, you know, um, embark upon will have to be done with a careful, of, with, the, with the utmost of consideration and utmost of reflections. You know, it's better to actually err slowly than just take the chance. Because once there's termination, even reversing the termination can sometimes be Herculean in some cases because a party can refuse to even accept your reversal effort and may still go to court. Once the termination, and if the termination is improper, the termination itself becomes the breach. And so your attempt to even remedy it is contingent on the other party cooperating. And that's why you don't normally want to cross that bridge. But of course, I'm, I'm confident that in this case, probably we start the process, the other side may listen. Now, if we ask you, to represent our interest as Ghana <laughs> in this matter, what advice would you give? You're putting me on the spot. Yes, I am. The interest of Ghana in terms of um, in terms of advising on the the way forward. The interest of Ghana are perhaps threefold. Win the case in court, in which case there's no judgment debt against us, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm, avoid going to co court completely. Mm -hmm. Or mitigating the, the, the judgment, the consequences of the judgment, and so on. What would you advise in the current circumstances? My understanding is that there's a great deal of diplomatic interest in this case. If there is a great deal of diplomatic interest in this case, as I understand, I think it's the most or is the least difficult case when it comes to going to court. Normally, in cases in which you have sovereigns mutually interested, and therefore the parties of the sovereigns. Um, being parties to a transaction with the sovereigns in the background. Normally, when one party is not happy, it's very easy to resolve once you get the two sovereigns talking and they talk at a higher level. And so the lawyer's advice, what was the initial complaint? How was the complaint reacted to? Are there remedies that have been put in place? Can we resolve this? It is very easy to stop the other party from going to court because normally courts tends to have uh, post-litigation consequences for the diplomatic relations. And so normally, governors don't like the idea of having to litigate if they don't have to. So because of the potential diplomatic interest in this case, that is what makes it very easy. And that's why, if I had the benefit of advising anyone, I would say this is the time to arrest it at the diplomatic level. It's very easy for government to engage government and get the parties seated. So the government, the two governments will agree that we are halting the process. And halting the process means now we are putting our parties to sit and look at the details and do all you can. In fact, sometimes governments actually instruct the parties, do everything you can to resolve this case. In other words, it is simply not going to court. So if it even means making concessions, if it means cutting your losses, if it means moving and shifting positions, just in the interest of ensuring that ultimately we have some settlement moving forward. Governments do that all the time. So my best advice is this case should simply not make it to court. It should simply not. The cost of litigation in London, the cost of litigation for both parties, the non-pecuniary cost to both entities at the government level, they are too huge. And it, it doesn't merit. Um, you know, it, it is simply not worth the the time and effort spent in court. If you end up in court and you have no choice and, you know, as a result of whatever factors invariably this matter ends up in court, again, the best way to cut your judgment losses, if you do not have 
a good case, and i.e., if you make an assessment and it's clear that um, the, the the termination of the contract was improperly done, then you will have to, you know, we normally call plea of mitigation. You will normally have to plead. So, for instance, one option is to plead to the court that the other party has identified the circumstances where it erred. It is, however, ready to make reparations and ensure that the parties are restored to the breach to the pre-breach status quo. And that is the best thing, actually. That, look, we are restoring all parties to the pre-breach status quo, which could include at this stage the fact that the, the termination is being reversed, the, whatever cost has been incurred between the period of the breach and the litigation will be paid, including the litigation, the cost of bringing the matter to court, among others. That invariably will still save you a lot of damages that could have been awarded against you. And I guarantee you, courts court consider and pay a lot of attention to pleas when parties repent and it's clear that the party is ready to make amends moving forward to ensure it doesn't happen again usually the parties are even happy to speak when one party speaks to the other party before courts that look this is our position and we're asking you not to oppose our position on the contrary support it the court may actually even come out and say both parties should bear their own costs respective costs mm -hmm. and nobody will pay anybody so i think if we do review the, con the contract, and again, from the complaints of the contractors in terms of the news items that have been carried out there, it, it may appear as if we may potentially be uh, in for another judgment debt if we are not careful. Because there has, so far, to the best of my knowledge, again, from all that I've, I've seen, there has so far not been a clear indication of a major breach, or of any breach, really, that warrants that. And so, if our understanding of the contractual terms and the circumstances of the conflict is anything to go by, then I think that we have cause to get worried again. Well, hello and welcome back to Hot Issues. And we are in conversation with Mr. Kofi <coughs> Abochi, uh, who is the dean of the Jimpa Law School. And, uh, sir, you, you, you've, you've read about some aspects of the leaked report, the Justice of House report. We have a situation where the High Court has actually pronounced Mr. Agwesi Woyumi not guilty of defrauding the state. And the Supreme Court has ruled that he needs to refund the money which were paid to him as judgment debt. What does all of this mean? <coughs> Law is a specific subject. And so when you make allegations against people, you have to establish those allegations. Fraud is a specific crime. That has specific elements. One of the key elements which needs to be established is the act of dishonesty. You can't establish fraud without establishing dishonesty. And you can't establish dishonesty without establishing intent. And so there must be an intent to be dishonest. And then therefore, if you translate that to the offense, there must be an intent to defraud. So the fact that I may have been paid monies I'm not due does not of itself implies that does not of itself imply the fact that I intended to defraud. I probably thought I was legitimately entitled to collect the amount. If I thought I was entitled to collect the amount, that cannot be fraud. And so if you put the two cases, the two decisions, the High Court's decision of acquittal, the Supreme Court's decision of order of repayment, if you put them together, the reconciliation could be that Mr. Alfred Agbeshiwayumi received payment he was not due without necessarily intending to defraud the state. But regardless of that not, with regardless of the intent not being there, he should recompense the state by paying back whatever he has taken. So the two, the two decisions are totally reconcilable. Okay. Now what about in that, in, that, in that case and in several other cases, there have been reports of the Attorney General not <coughs> representing the state in these proceedings. What do you make of that? It certainly is an issue that cannot be glossed over. Um, I'm not sure the Attorney General herself or himself, if it's a man or woman in power, I think you're talking about the Attorney General's department, or you're speaking of the Attorney General as Attorney General. The Attorney General's department. department in several yes. of the cases, in several not of the cases. one. Correct. I mean, they did not represent us Correct. at all in Correct. court. That goes, that goes to a major issue of, um, as I indicated earlier, institutional... Uh, dysfunction, for want of a better word, or, you know, in some cases, even more administration. 
um, as to whether people who have been slated by specific departments within the department ought to have showed up, which is invariably a yes answer, and as to whether supervisory mechanisms that have been put in place to ensure that people who have been sent to represent the state's interest in court were there, and not only were they there, that they actually were there and they applied themselves to the standards of the profession in such defensive cases. The question is, you can only actually, the question is to what extent were all the mechanisms put in place working? And if they were not working, whose responsibilities were they to ensure they were working? And ultimately, how do we ensure that we move on from this point of, you know, rather dangerous omissions? Mm -hmm. It is true. There has been instances, you know, where state cases have been called in court. In fact, we've actually had instances where even judgment, judges recently have openly commented on that. So it is not an issue that can be denied. The mm -hmm. fact that uh, state attorneys may not have been in court when they ought to have been in court. But as I indicated, the key question is, what are the supervisory mechanisms in place? And how functional are these supervisory mechanisms? Because too often, the state suffers consequences. And the consequences are default judgment, because we've not filed our documents, and we've not shown up in court. Or well, the consequences are the other side has finished making out its case. The state is not ready because we are not in court, and therefore the court makes a decision that the state is deemed to have closed its case, mm -hmm. case closed. So it's, it's a complex of issues, and that's why I indicated earlier. Interface of human factors, institutional factors, and other cultural. The cultural being both human and institutional, which ought to change. And unless and until we actually come to a point of change, it's it's going to be very difficult. Even if you put in place new systems and mechanisms, you're going to have the human factor ultimately failing these good intents. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for coming to the studio. Thank you. And it's been a great pleasure having you in the studio again. Thank you. But well, we've been in a conversation with Mr. Kofi Abochi, Dean of the Faculty of Law of JIMPA, the JIMPA Law School, JIMPA Law School. And we've been talking about judgment debts, the implications, what is likely to happen in the future, and especially we've been talking about the digital migration contract, which has just been abrogated and its consequences for the state of Ghana.